Happy Sabbath. Always good to be in the house of the Lord. Always good to see you all. Um, I talked to the elder last night, and he had just a little trepidation about the title of this, so I had to break it down to him. So I'm going to break it down to you guys, too, as I go on. So I'm just going to get started and get right into it. Uh, as I'm a two in age, well, really, as I, I'm getting old, as I get older, I begin to ponder certain aspects of life, and then I try to reconcile what makes us all human. In other words, what is the common thread that we all possess that's unique to us as human beings? And there are several things that come to mind. However, the one thing that sticks out is human beings, we're not driven by instinct like animals. Like if you ever watch the wildebeest migrate through the Serengeti, they do it every year. It's, it's a natural, it's a nature thing that they do. Every year they, they follow the same path across the, the desert of Africa to go here to mate and then come back. And they follow the, the grazing path wherever the grass is and they follow the food sources. We're not that way. We have focus and we, we have a drive and we have a commitment to accomplishing or achieving a goal. And when we get focused and we think about something, for the most part, that thing becomes a thing that we're obsessed with. We think about it, we think about it until we realize either that goal is unattainable or we're gonna keep trying until we actually hit that mark. So at some point we may realize that the effort is not worth the benefit or the juice is not worth the squeeze, right? And we'll focus on something else. And then you have certain people who are really just different. They stand out. People like Thomas Edison, Martin Luther King Jr., Hank Aaron, or Tom Brady. See, these people have went through things, and then they had setbacks, but they continued on the course because they had a focus. They had a drive. They had a commitment to accomplish something. And they didn't let anything deter them. And they were committed to seeing the goal realized to the end. But some folks get discouraged when the road isn't easy. Some folks don't feel invested to press on. And you see, in this world, we have things that we become fond of, be it our family members, a certain dress, a certain shirt, a certain suit, or even a car that you may put a lot of sweat equity in, money and time, to get it to a point where you're very proud of it. You got the windows tinted, you got a certain paint job, you got certain type of wheels on it. You got it where you want it. You, you put a lot of equity into that. And you're happy with the end result. And there's nothing wrong with taking care of your possessions and the blessings that God give you. And being thankful for the many blessings that he has given you. My only question would be, how much do you love these things over the person who's made the provision for you to have these things? So let us begin today in the book of Luke, starting at the 12th chapter. I'm reading out of the King James Version. Book of Luke 12 chapter verses 15 through 21. And this is Jesus talking to the disciples. And he said unto them, take heed, be aware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possess. And he spoke a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. So this man must have been a farmer, right? And he thought, within himself saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and I will build bigger ones. And there I will bestow all my fruits and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods. You have many things laid up for many years. Take a rest, take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thou soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which you have provided? Where does all that money go? Because you can't take it with you. And it really doesn't answer the question of satisfying your soul. So he that layeth up treasure for himself is not rich toward God. So we see this rich man. He's obsessed with his abundance, and he has considered all things worldly, but neglected to really address the needs of his soul. He thought that by amassing 
worldly goods that he was content in his soul. Really. I look at the paper and I see the moves that these people are making like uh, Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and Bill Gates. And I never really see them smiling. They have a lot of weight on them. And these are some of the richest men in the world, billionaires. Matter of fact, Bezos is the first trillionaire, first trillionaire ever. But is he really happy? Let's turn to Matthew's sixth chapter, verses 19 to 21. Because that's where we get some good instruction. We get some good foundation, some good doctrine. It says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where the moth and the rust do corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust do corrupt and where thieves cannot break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That's some really sound wisdom there. And the word of God is, is just that. So when you think about it, this is one of the main reasons that many reject the word of God and the way of salvation today, because they don't want to give up fleshly treasures, whatever they may be. We will not we, but some people would would rather resist taking a decrease in order to get the increase. Y'all need to think about that. Joseph, he took the decrease. And at the end, he got the increase. He went from the jailhouse to the White House. He took the decrease to get the increase. But because he did, is one secret to that. He followed God's way. He didn't follow the way of men. But some of us, get so embedded in our stature of wealth and possessions and our stations in life that we become numb to conviction. And I dare say they have no fear or reverence of the most high. No fear, no reverence. But going back to Luke 12, and I'm gonna start in Luke 12 and five, which says this, but I will forewarn you whom you shall fear. Fear him, fear the most high, which after he have killed, have power to cast into hell. Yes, I say unto you, fear him. He has the power to cast you into hell. So let us reason together. When we want something, we set it in our hearts and minds to make that thing a reality. We become focused on that thing, whatever it is we want, we ignore all distractions that come our way. And if we truly want this thing we desire, we're going to just be locked in on it. Now we can do other things. We can multitask, but that thing we want is always on our mind. That car we want, that stove we want, that child we want, it could be anything. And I'll give you an example. I have a favorite restaurant that I really enjoy going to. It's not super expensive, but it is a little pricey, but it's worth it. And you need to reserve a table because it's not a fast foods joint and they have a very large clientele. So they're always full, they're always packed. So when I take my wife and or my friends there, I have to prepare. I set my mind that I wanna to go to this restaurant because they have my favorite, favorite dish, whatever that is, right? So first I gotta plan for it. I gotta make sure first of all I have the money, right? And then I gotta make sure I got gas in my car. And, and then I have to make a reservation to get to the restaurant because it's, it's always full. Then, because it's not just any restaurant, I don't wanna go there looking like anything. I gotta dress appropriate. And then I gotta leave my house in time to get there. And I do that because I want to, and I have it set in my mind to do so. So let's say you want to do something sinful. It works the same way. You set your mind to that sin you're about to commit. 
And you may not necessarily plan for it. It may be part of your DNA. It may be something that you've done out of habit because you just keep doing it, right? However, it is into you to commit the sin, and then the plan is there all the time. You will resource that sin no matter how or what you have to do, and you will not let anything get in your way, not even the word of God, because in your mind, you have rationalized that the juice is worth the squeeze. I heard some people say, I've heard a lot of comedians say this back in the day. I don't hear it that much anymore, but I used to hear a lot of comedians say this. Oh, well, if I go to hell, all my friends are going to be there, and this isn't going to be nothing but a great big party. I don't get that. What part of wailing and gnashing of teeth do you not get? Hell is not a party. But I've heard that, and I know some of you have heard that before. Comedians say that. Yeah, the reverend told me if I don't get right, I'm going to hell. And I told him, <laughs> well, when I get there, all my friends are going to be there, so it'll just be another party. No, it's not going to be that kind of party. It ain't that type of party. So that made me realize something. Some people, even though you have to try, you're not going to be able to reach because they may just be children of the devil. And the hard part about it is they could be in your families. In Romans 3, third chapter, verses 10 through 18, it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that do good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. And here's the thing that's really sad. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, you all know I've always talked about my military background. That right there, what I read, is what we would consider intelligence about the enemy force. If I know what I'm going out against and I know what they're capable of, that gives me some advantage, right? Because I know. It's just like if I was going into battle and I knew what kind of weapons they have directed against me, then I can prepare for those. Maybe armor up a little bit more or, or even avoid those weapons and figure a way around those things. So that's, that's intelligence about the enemy, the children of the enemy. And these children of the enemy... They don't fear, respect, or even have the compunction to obey the word of the Heavenly Father. They will oppose you at every turn. And if they can't win you over to their side, they will despise and hate you. And there's, here's the thing. There are more of them than there are of us. Usually in, in, in the worldly system of battle, the side who inflicts the most casualties is the winner. But that's the battle. We know the war is won. But this is going to be the only war that's ever been fought where they have more people than we do. I don't think you follow me. What I'm saying is usually when you win a war, you, you inflict so much harm or you, you impose your will in such a way that you dominate that enemy where you have a superior force than them. If we just look at this by numbers alone, there's more people lost than there are that's going to be saved. We know that. So if you would open your books to Matthew 7 chapter, this kind of brings that to fruition for you. Matthew 7 chapter, verses 13 and 14. It says, verse 13 Enter you at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there 
B, which go there at. So there's a lot of people going in that wide gate. It's a big gate, right? You notice, like, if you if you if you're headed north, you would rather get on 75 because you got three and four lanes. It's wide. You won't take Coolidge because it's probably two, two at most four lanes, two on each side. But the wider way is where all the centers are going. It's a bigger bigger and broader pathway. Verse 14 says, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead unto life and few there be that find it. So that goes back to what I was saying. The numbers don't actually add up. There's only a few of us going this way, but it's a whole lot of us going that way. That's right. This is right and this is left. A lot of people going to the left. This is the battle we as saints, we're losing every day, but we got to keep fighting. If we base wins and losses on the number of casualties or souls that are won over, well, we can't do that because that would be discouraging. But like I say, this is the only war where in the end, the numbers will be skewed in the enemy's favor. But to what end? Where are they going? What is the end result? Why is this so? Because it says, narrow is the way that leads to life, but only a few will find it. It, it, I was talking to one of the sisters this morning, and I asked her, I said, you got to look on your face today. And she said, I look this way because of the situation of the world today. She was right. It is something that will hurt your soul as a person who loves his brother. So the title of my message today comes in the form of a question. And it's not a question that I pose to those who are lost sinners, because we're all sinners. But it's also for the so-called believer who is walking the fence but claims to fear God, who can cast him in hell, but still continues to live in sin even though they know better. So last night I was talking to Herb about this title. And he said, you know, he just kind of said, "Uh, I wonder what this is going to be all about. So I kind of broke it down to him. When I was younger, there was one common phrase that everybody who was out there evangelizing would always use. And you always saw it coming. And you knew immediately where this conversation was going. And then you knew what immediately to do. If you didn't want to hear, oh, here we go. You can move on. And that phrase was, excuse me, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, Lord? They've been saying that, and it doesn't even matter what church you go to. All denominations, all of them would say that. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes we got to reach the people where they are. We have to come up with more bolder marketing techniques. We have to appeal to them with a tagline that gets them going. So, once again, you will commit to anything you're doing because you know what that goal is. I already showed you that. Herb has told us many times how he committed to Anika and the things he went through to get Anika, right? He was focused. He was driven. And at the end, he got Anika. But that was where he, his goals were. He told some stuff that I would never tell nobody. He said some things that I would never do, but it was good. But it, there's no point in that because we all got some stories. We all got some stories. I appreciate the brother's honesty and candidness. But the point is, people will commit to doing what they want to do to get a certain result. And if they know what that result is, they will even strive even harder to get to that result. So the form of the question and the title of this message is, what in hell do you want? Now, let me clarify. My goal is to show you that this world, this life, and all the things that make you think you are content in your soul are nothing but fleeting illusions that have no intrinsic value. But what the Father offers is well beyond anything your soul could imagine and thus worth the effort and the sacrifice you put into it. But people would rather do sinful things knowing 
it leads to death. Do they really know that? Or do they think that when they get to hell, it's going to be a great big party? So the question is, and I'm asking this sincerely to get their attention. What in hell do you want? Hopefully that will go. What? What you say to me, brother? And I repeat, what in hell do you want? Now I got your attention. Let's have a discussion. So let me pull the, uh, the thread a little bit on the possession part, because that is a major stumbling block. Stuff, right? Stuff. Some people will not let go of their stuff, even if it, even if it takes them to hell. Let's go to Matthew 19, 16 to 23. And behold, one came and said unto him, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus, Yeshua, said unto him, why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is Yahweh. But if thou wilt enter into life, eternal life, keep the commandments. And he said unto him, which? And Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now before I read verse 20, I just want to stop there. There's a certain preacher on TV who says, because Jesus did not mention keep the Sabbath, you don't have to keep it. And... He says, he can show you in Bible that this is what Jesus said, all you have to do to have eternal life. But there are other verses that say, if you break one commandment, you broke them all. So I want to make sure that if you hear somebody say that this is all that Jesus said you had to do to get eternal life, he was paraphrasing. But the point is, he also said, if you break one commandment, you broke them all. So continuing on. And the man said unto him, all these things have I kept from my youth. What lack I yet? What still am I lacking? I've done all this stuff, but what am I lacking that's keeping me from having eternal life? And Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven. Remember we talked about where your heart is is also where your treasures are and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had a lot of stuff. Couldn't let it go. He had great possessions, and he just could not let it go. And Jesus said unto, um, no, no, no. Then Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says it's more difficult. You, it doesn't mean that if you're rich, you're not going to heaven. It's just more difficult for some people who are rich to get in. And see, this was not just relevant in Yeshua's time, but it exists even more so today. We have many more rich people in the world than back then because there are more people in the world than back then. Therefore, I would submit to you that people will reject the way if it means giving up their worldly treasures to do so. But it isn't just money. How about that sweet thing you shack up with? Or maybe not shack up with, but you meet in secret and do your dirt. And then you come to church, whatever day you come, and you put on your holy airs like you never done nothing wrong. Or what about that joint you smoke with your non-church friends so you can show them how cool you are, even though you claim to follow Jesus and the ways of the Lord? I could go on and on and on, ad nauseum, but you get the drift. And let's talk about those non-physical things, what's in your mind and in your heart that you hang on to as well, because they can also keep you out of the kingdom. Let's go to 1 John 3, 10, and 15. Everybody doing all right? I'm going to keep you long today, but I just want to, I want to share this word with you. 1 John 3, 10 to 15. In this, the children of God are manifest, and, and the children of the devil Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, 
that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one and slew his brother, and wherefore slew he him, because his own works were evil and his brother righteous. Marvel not, my brother, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death unto life. That's verse 14. I didn't, I didn't, because we love the brethren, and he that loved not his brother abideth in death. So whosoever hate his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. See, some of us believe we can make it into the kingdom and bring this type of luggage with us. You carry hurtful and bad feelings about someone who did you wrong, or maybe you just don't like someone because of how they look or how they talk or how they act. I don't know. But that's some heavy luggage to be carrying around on your heart. Leave those bags behind you and make peace with those you have ought against. It may be as simple as having a conversation. And even if they don't want peace with you, you will have peace because the Lord will lift that burden from your heart. I, I want to just talk real quick about the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a depiction of Christ's return to earth, where we reign with him in his kingdom. But in the earthly form, getting to the Feast of Tabernacles is a challenge for us. I'll give you one of my challenges. Now, I love it, but I really love going down to Panama City, Destin. I love doing that. But the, one, the two things I don't particularly like about going to the feast is the beginning and the end. And not the actual feast itself, but the preparation. Packing all those bags, loading all those bags up onto the truck, making reservations. And then I have to, when I get there, I got to take all that baggage off the, out the truck, me and my wife or whoever else we go with, take it to the room, unpack it. And then when we leave, pack it back up. And sometimes we come back with more than we left with, right? And pack all that stuff up. And sometimes we even have to ship stuff home. That's a, I mean, yeah, those are blessings, but that's just a part of it. I don't like the logistics of it. I don't like the logistics of it, but I understand what it is and I understand why we do it. I don't have a problem with that. But one day, one day, I won't need to pack anymore. One day, I won't need to worry about making a reservation or worrying about where I'm going to stay because I'm right now trying to lock in that reservation in this life, trying to lock that reservation in. That in the next life, you know how when you go to the hotel and they ask uh, name, reservation, they open up a book, and your name is in that book. See, one day, I hope that I make the reservation now so that one day when I'm ready to go into the kingdom and when I step up to the desk getting into the kingdom, my name is already in that book. Praise God. That's what I'm striving for. I don't have to be worried about getting ready to leave on the last great day because when that last great day comes, that would signify me dwelling with him forever. I don't have to worry about packing up to come home because I'm already at home. That's where I'm trying to go. I'm trying to go home. This ain't home. I'm trying to go home. I'm trying to get to that place. I'm trying to make my reservation. Because when I get there, usually when I go to a hotel with my travel, they say, and how many nights will you be staying? In this case, when they ask me, I'll say, forever. I'll be here forever. I'm looking forward to that. In Revelations 21, verses 1 through 7, this is what following the right way, this is what it yields. This is what following God's way gets you. This is the benefit. This is the consequence. This is the end result. And it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, 
and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's what I'm looking forward to right there. And God will wipe away those tears that my sister were about to shed today about the situation of the world from her eyes and your eyes. And there shall be no more death, no more passing away, neither sorrow. There won't be no reason to cry. Neither shall there be any more pain. Some of us wake up in the morning and things just hurt for no reason. In the, in the stupidest places. I don't even want to get into that. But sometimes you just wake up and you just find yourself as you get older and you're getting pains. And you're like, how is the bone in my middle finger hurting? What did I do? But it just hurts. For the former things are passed away. That's what you get when you follow God's way. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. Don't you like new stuff? Don't you like new stuff? Don't you like that new car smell? Don't you like the new way new clothes feel on you? He's going to give us new clothes. Don't you like fresh food? Fresh food. Not been sitting on a store shelf for three or four months. Fresh. Everything's going to be new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. Meaning you can bank on these words. And he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. And he that overcomes. See, there's a price to this. You got to overcome some things. Did I not tell you the world will hate you? But you got to overcome those things. And I will be his God because he shall inherit all things and he shall be my son or my daughter. That's the carrot. Now, here comes the stick. Revelations 21, 8. Now, you see all that stuff. There were seven verses dedicated to what you do if you follow God's way. Revelations 21 and 8, the next verse. But the fearful. Remember, I told you guys, don't be afraid. We talked about that. The unbelieving, the abominable. What's abominations? Things that God hates. Homosexuality, abortion, idolatry. Whoremongers, shacking up, not married. Sorcerers, what's your sign? Idolaters, all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's the hell. That's the hell right there. These are the things. These are the behaviors that send you to hell, the lake of fire, if you don't repent. If you're over here doing this and you don't want to, and you're not trying to strive to get over here, this is going to lead you to Revelations 21 and 8. So I ask you again, what in hell do you want? That's what's there for you. If your spiritual GPS is set in on the lake of fire as your final destination, then it's time to cancel that route and reprogram a new one. And you need the kingdom's coordinates to do that. And their actual coordinates of how to get to the kingdom of heaven. What are those? Well, I'm glad you asked. If you ever been lost and can't find your way and you're in deep in the territory that you want to get away from, Call on the name of the Lord and he would deliver you. Let's go to John 14, 1 through 6. And it tells you not to worry. It says, John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Because, once again, I'm making that reservation because this is where I want to go. In my father's house are many mansions. Now, I done seen the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I done seen some good homes. I done been over there with Herb Live, where they made the movie Sparkle. I done been all around. I done seen some nice houses, Palmer Woods and, and uh, Rosedale Park. And I done seen all these big palatial estates. But I ain't never seen a house with many mansions. But I'm going to have one. That's what I'm working for. 
That's the reservation I made. That's the book I'm trying to get my name written in so that I can have one of those. And I believe it because of this here. It says, if it were not so, I would have told you. But he says, he says, he's going to prepare a place for me and you. And if he's going there to prepare a place for you and me, he's going to come again. Oh, he's coming again. And he is going to receive you and me unto him that where he is, we may be also. Once again, that's what happens when you do this. So you can get with this or you can get with that. But you ought to get with this because this is where it's at. Right. That's that's the truth there. So. Verse four says, and whether I go, you know, the way, you know. And then Thomas, Thomas said to him, Lord, we know not where you're going and how can we know the way? Oh, come on, Thomas. You batting a thousand in the Bible, man. Uh, uh, uh. And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh to the father, but by me. That's a good news story right there. If you ain't feeling good about that, I don't know what's wrong with you. But once we know this and we're talking to that person that we're trying to ask him, why is he living this foul life? I would ask that person, what does the other side offer that makes you so stubborn and steadfast on living what you call your best life that you aren't willing to get with this? So. Romans 6, verses 19 to 23, tells us, this is Paul speaking, and it says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even now, so now, yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. So he's telling us, we're using our bodies for sinful reasons. Let's use our bodies for righteousness and holiness. For when you are servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit, what, what fruit had you in those things whereof you are now ashamed? So all of us who have gotten on this side, we look back on that stuff, and sometimes we wonder, man, I don't even know why I was doing all that foolishness. We're ashamed of it. Because we know the end of those things is death. Death. But now being made free from sin, and this is the selling point to those on this side, you can be made free of that and become servants to God. And you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Death, life. For the wages of sin is death. Nothing else. Ain't no party. Ain't no wealth. Ain't no fame and glory. Just death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach. So, in summation, the Heavenly Father, our Lord and Savior, our Messiah, wants us to have life and more abundantly, which means life beyond this world where there is peace, life beyond this world where there is prosperity, life beyond this world where there's no suffering, no war, no disease, no lack or poverty, no fear, no lying, no adultery, no stealing, no killing, no evil whatsoever. That's what his way offers. And all the other side offers is for a minute, fleeting minute, wealth, fame, fortune, and then a torturous and agonizing trip to the lake of fire, which we also are referring to as hell. And then it's all said and done. Yet, 
Some people may not accept what we're selling. Some people will still reject the gospel and cling to their fleshly desires no matter what. And for those stiff-necked, unrepenting sinners, I shake my head and I shed a tear like my sister did today. And I don't even say it sternly. I don't say it strongly. I say it with love and sadness. What in hell do you want?